to the Future. Tonight's Get Me Back to the Future is directed by our producer, Sarah Peachy, and it's one of her all-time favourite film franchises, so we're incredibly excited about what's to come. If this is your first time seeing a Show Must Go Online presentation, our self-isolated actors across the globe collaborate from their living rooms, using ingenuity, resourcefulness and found items to bring to life the complete works of Shakespeare every Wednesday at 7pm BST or 2pm EDT over at youtube.com forward slash Rob Miles. Whether you're a Shakespeare fan or you've never seen Shakespeare before, we'd love for you to join us for Romeo and Juliet this Wednesday, a play filled with the same youthfulness, energy and boisterousness as Back to the Future, albeit with less of the time travel. To Today's show will last for approximately 40 minutes, after which we will introduce you to the cast and crew, followed by a 20-minute Q&A with the author himself, Ian Desher, and the team. If you enjoy what you see tonight, please consider visiting quirkbooks.biz, where you can buy Ian's books, and they'll share 30% of the profits with the show must go online for all books bought in the month of May. You can find a link to the shop in the description of this video. For tonight's show... Please capture your reactions using the hashtags PopShakespeareLive and Show Must Go Online. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at TSMG Online Live and QuirkBooks at QuirkBooks. At this time, to introduce our special presentation, it's my pleasure, honour and indeed privilege to welcome the author himself, Ian Desher. Ian is the best-selling author of the William Shakespeare Star Wars series, the Pop Shakespeare series, and other books combining Shakespeare and pop culture. He holds a bachelor's degree from Yale University, a master's degree from Yale Divinity School, and a PhD from Union Theological Seminary. Ian lives in Portland, Oregon, with his spouse Jennifer, his children, and his dog Thorfinn. Ian, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show to introduce your work. The play, as you know, is Get Thee Back to the Future, and the floor is yours. Thank you once again, Rob. Thank you once again at The Show Must Go Online and Quirk Books, of course. Hello, everyone. Uh, let's go back in time. Do you remember 1985? Were you alive? Uh, I was eight years old at the time, old enough to fall in love with Back to the Future, if not understand all of its references. The DeLorean was awesome. Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd were hilarious. And the story was incredibly entertaining. My family had the movie on VHS, of course, and I watched it regularly. The to-be-continued ending had the desired effect on me, and I remember clearly a time when I thought the sequels would never come, even though they arrived only four years later. By the way, while we're talking about the sequels, I hope you all caught the fact that Jeffrey Weissman, who is playing Doc in today's production, originally played the role of George McFly in Back to the Future 2 and 3. How cool is that? Back to the Future is celebrating its 35th anniversary this year. And speaking of anniversaries, I'm seven years now into writing Shakespearean adaptations of popular movies. For years after William Shakespeare's Star Wars came out, people asked me, will you ever write a Shakespearean adaptation other than Star Wars? And I honestly didn't know. Several movies or series were suggested to me and Back to the Future was always on the list. Yesterday, as I was preparing for this event, I looked back through my email to see when QuirkBooks first suggested we adapt Back to the Future. I found an email from my editor on November 29th, 2017, suggesting we move forward with the project. It was about 17 months between that email and the publication of William Shakespeare's Get Thee Back to the Future on April 23rd, 2019. April 23rd, of course, being the day when we commemorate Shakespeare's birth and death. Let me give a quick behind the scenes look at my adaptation, which I hope you enjoy as much as I enjoy sharing it. When I wrote this book, I was struck by how central Marty McFly is to the movie. Of course he is, right? Most scenes begin and end with him somewhere in the shot. This raised a few challenges rewriting the movie as though it were a play. In a theatrical production, the last person on stage in a scene is not usually the first person on in the next scene. The actors need a chance to get set for the next scene or to change costumes or whatever. I tried my hardest to make sure Marty had breathing room between the scenes, which often meant ending or starting a scene with another character's soliloquy. Still, my guess, though I haven't actually counted, is that Marty McFly has far more lines in this adaptation than any other character does in my books. Here's some things you won't see today. Marty has a few speeches in the book that are exactly 88 lines long for obvious reasons. One of my original 88 line speeches for Marty, which was cut significantly during editing of the book, was the speech he gives when he returns to 1985 and sees his girlfriend, Jennifer, for the first time. My spouse is named Jennifer, so I had jumped at the chance to have Marty soliloquize about his beloved Jennifer. Alas, most of the speech was left on the cutting room floor, as it were. Here's another thing. In Act 1, when we first meet George and Biff, George's lines all use weak endings, meaning an added 11th syllable at the end of the iambic pentameter, whereas Biff's lines are all normal, strong endings. 
In act five, when their roles are reversed, their rhythms are too. Biff now has weak endings and George uses strong ones. Back to the Future has many classic songs and I tried to pay homage to all of them as best I could. This includes a sonnet version of Huey Lewis's song, The Power of Love. In my adaptation, Marty sings the song spontaneously in act one after Jennifer kisses him and exits. As a sonnet, The Power of Love goes like this. The power of love, oh, tis a curious thing. It changeth hawks into a gentle dove. It maketh one man weep, another sing. More than a feeling, tis the power of love. Tis tougher e'en than diamonds, rich like cream. It makes a bad one good, a wrong one right. Tis stronger, harder than a wench's dream. The power of love shall keep thee home at night. When first thou feelest it may make thee sad. When next thou feelest it may be profound. Yet when thou learnest this, thou shalt be glad. It is this power makes the world go round. Tis strong and sudden, sent by heaven above. It may just save thy life, life this power of love. William Shakespeare's Get Thee Back to the Future was written before William Shakespeare's Much Ado About Mean Girls, even though they were published on the same day. That means the Back to the Future was my first opportunity to adapt a story set in our world rather than a galaxy far, far away. Marty's voyage to 1955, his adventures there, and his eventual return to his home reminded me in a broad sense of Odysseus's journey in the Odyssey. Throughout the book, therefore, I make references to the Odyssey. Lorraine compares herself to Circe at one point, Marty compares Biff to the Cyclops, and so on. Listen carefully for one of those references in today's performance. Let's get to it. Thank you one more time to The Show Must Go Online for today's show and for the past three Pop Shakespeare shows, which have been so much fun. Thank you to today's amazing director, Sarah Peachy, and to our fabulous cast. And now let's go. Back to 1985. Thank you so much for that incredible introduction, Ian. Fascinating stuff to learn about the 88-line speeches and the rhythm inversions and that Power of Love sonnet is incredible. So, ladies and gentlemen, the show is about to begin. So please remember to capture your reactions on social using the hashtags Pop Shakespeare Live and Show Must Go Online. And without further ado, please enjoy selected scenes from Ian Desch's Shakespeare's Get Thee Back to the Future. La 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 Act one, scene one, the year nineteen eighty five at Doc Brand's house. Enter Marty McFly. Hail, Marty! Art thou there? Oh, good dark forsooth. Where art thou, friend? For I came to thy house expecting I should find thee at thy breakfast. Ah, <laughs> dear gratias that thou art found, and also that thou art both safe and whole. <clears throat> Canst thou meet me tonight at Twin Pines Mall upon the very stroke of 115? A major breakthrough I have made, my friend, and shall thy brave assistance require? Thou wouldst engage me thither at the hour of 115, which after midnight comes, when normal folk do lie abed and sleep, we too shall be outside adventuring? We shall, and thou shalt never forget this night. What is the matter that doth move thee so? And say, where hast thou been the live long week? Whilst for thee I have searched with urgency. I engaged in testing mine experiments. Pray, what of Einstein? Is the pup with thee? <laughs> he sitteth at my feet, e'en now. Thy house, it is in shambles, didst thou know? All thine equipment thou didst leave to run some six or seven days now by my trope. Who equipment saith thou? Uh, <clears throat> the very word doth prompt remembrance of another thing, the amplifier uh, for thy loot. Thou shouldst not use it at present, for there is a chance, uh, be it uh, but a slight chance indeed, uh, still there's a chance. The system may o'erload and blast the whole. Thus shall I keep in mind. Had he but been five minutes sooner, this advice would help. Tis well, I shall then see thy face tonight. I bid thee, Marty, to forget it not. A quarter past the stroke of one o'clock at Twin Pines Mall, I'll see thee soon. Indeed. Alas, 
Yes, what ringing? Why has this commenced the tintinabulations of the bell? Peace, uh, peace, peace. Count the clock. The clock hath stricken eight. Aha! <laughs> then mine experiment hath worked. <laughs> they run as slowly as a tortoise gate behind minutes, counting twenty-five. What shocking words are thou, thou, thou speakst to me? What presage of mine own delayed arrival? What prelude to a future punishment? What fable of a race against the clock? It's true what thou dost calmly say to me. The time is verily 825? Precisely. Science is not lost on thee. Oh, fie upon it. I must play the hare and skip most jauntily upon my path, for I am late to school again. Oh, Godspeed then, Marty, and on thy merry way. When this my baby, source of all my hopes, doth hit upon the speed of 88 in miles per hour, then, Marty, verily, thine eyes shall witness shit most serious. Nay, bastard, base, my friend, my doc, is murdered for mine eyes. Tis time, the time hath come, the time hath gone. Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 2. In the town of Hill Valley, the year 1955. Enter Marty McFly. November 5th of 1955. This must be some strange dream and nothing more. Or yonder is perhaps mine only hope, a public telephone in a cafe, wherewith I may find Doc, who should be here, wherever or whenever I may be. Uh, knowest thou where 1640 Riverside? Shalt thou some morsel order, wayward lad? Indeed, uh, give me a tab. A tab thou'lt have once thou dost place thine order. Knowest thou not how this doth work in modern times as these? A Pepsi free then, prithee, shall be mine. No Pepsi free, thou must pay for thy drink. The man doth turn my words in baffling circles as if they were a top and he the spinner. Give me some drink that hath no sugar, yea, tis all I ask of thee. Aught lacking sugar. Thou art a puzzling and a naughty lad. I'll give thee coffee black with sugar none. Thou imp, McFly, what art thou at herein? Beth Tannen, by my troth, yet young and strong. I speak to thee, McFly, thou Irish pest. Uh, hello there, Biff, uh, and Sarah all, hello. Hast thou my homework finished yet, McFly? In truth, it is not yet completed, Biff, because it is not you until far later. I'll bash thee on thy pate, and thou so speaks. Our brains herein, I must knock and see. Use thou okay. thy mind, and with it think, McFly. I must have time and note to write the words <laughs> in mine own hand, as the work were mine. Upon what lookest thou, thou arse like pate? Uh, forsooth, Biff, I, I shall finish it tonight, delivering it to thee upon the morrow. Shall this suffice? It shall, but be not too early. My want on Sundays is to slumber late. Oh, look below, McFly, thy shoe's untied. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thou art too gullible by thrice, McFly. Now, as I leave, hear thou these final words. I would not see thy face herein again. Biff, what a wondrous person. Ta, farewell. Amazing sight. My father, oh, tis he. Exit Marty. Act 3, Scene 2. Just outside Hill Valley and at Doc Brown's house. Enter Marty and Doc. My God above! Dost thou know what this means? It means this damn contraption doesn't work! Behold, my friend, the work of 30 years as I exhibit how a simple sketch hast by thy hand come reality. Oh! Oh! oh, 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 oh. It, it, it worketh! It, it, it worketh! Oh, mark the day! Finally, I invented something that uh, ought that worketh! Well, certainly it is, it worketh. That I stand in 1955 is ample proof. Thou couldst bet bottom dollar it is so. Let us sneak this Unto my laboratory, we shall return thee home. This do I vow. The night we sent me hither to this time, we made a record of the experiment. This video I shall connect unto thy television that thou mayst behold. Come now 
and thou shalt see what we have done. <clears throat> oh, yeah, tis I! Observe how old I've become. Your ears. My name you know, tis Dr. Emmett Brown. I stand upon the stony parking lot of the Twin Pines Mall, Hill Valley, California. Thank be to God, I still have all my hair. Yet what are these strange garments I wear? Arrayed art thou in radiation suits. A radiation suit? Of course, of course, from all the fallout from atomic war. Methought it would be so, I see it is. For never was there peacetime made to last. I have advanced the tape unto the part that I would have thee see, Doc. Vital tis. Nay, nay, the <laughs> splendid craft's electrical. Yet it requires a nuclear reaction to generate the mighty current of the 1.21 gigawatts. What, what did I say? Uh, pr pretty, uh, play again. Nay, the splendid craft's electrical. Yet it requires a nuclear reaction to generate the mighty current of the 1.21 gigawatts Whoa. of power. Oh, 1.21 in gigawatts? Oh, oh, gigawatts of 1.21? Great Scott! Oh, oh, what have I done? How can this be? Doc, what in the hell's name's a gigawatt? <laughs> How could I have been so careless, so unthinking? Uh, 1.21 gigawatts. Oh, Tom, oh, Tom, friend, companion, inventor. Why is it? How shall I generate this awesome power? How? How? Not even thee? In thy harsh debates with Tesla, as your two most brilliant minds did wrestle with these matters most electric, conceive of such a great and staggering sum as 1.1, 1 1.21 1 in gigawatts. It cannot be accomplished. Nay. Oh, tis simple, Doc, and I shall tell thee how, as thou in 30 years will tell to me, we need no more than some plutonium. <laughs> in thy 1985, perchance, Plutonium is found in every market upon the shelves with cheese or eggs or milk as simple as buying a, a pear or onions for a picnic at the park. In 1955, however, it is far harder to obtain plutonium. With my regrets, good Marty, I'll explain. Thou shalt be bound unto this present time. Canst never leave as long as thou shalt live. Canst never leave? Oh, speak thou not these words. I must return and not be here confined. A life I have in 1985. Moreover, there's my lass, my Jennifer, who, like the loyal true Penelope, will be there waiting for me. Is she fair? Her beauty is beyond compare to me. And whether it is by luck or miracle, she loveth me with whole and eager heart. I'm sorry, Marty. But the only source that can such massive electricity produce is from a lightning bolt. Again? A lightning bolt. <laughs> Exeon. <laughs> Act three, scene three, at Hill Valley High School. Enter Marty McFly and Doc Brown. School doth look so tidy, fresh and new, as though a dignitary were expected. Remember, if my theory is correct, thou hast, by chance, in some way, interfered at the first meeting of thy parents too. If they meet not, they shall not fall in love. If they fall not in love, <laughs> well, they shall not marry. If they do marry not, they shall have no offspring. Uh, and if they have no offspring, Marty, then I fear for thee. What may befall thee? Methinks tis why thine older brother Dave is disappearing from the photograph. Thine older sister follows him in time. Unless thou canst repair the damage done, twill be thy fate as well to disappear. So heavy is this matter by my troth. Nay, nay, Marty, weight hath not to do with all. The students come. <clears throat> uh, which pupil is thy father? Uh, just there, assaulted by a band of boys. 
In all, in all, your jests are o'er. Or ye are so funny and mature as well. <laughs> How it doth pay me seeing father thus? Some brute hath written kick me on a sign, affixed it to my father's waiting back, and now the cowards render him his due. Oh, father, was it ever thus for thee? Uh, mayhap thou wert adopted, possibly? A jest indeed, and full of wit and mirth. Your nasty kicks have made me drop my books. Which one of ye shall pick them up? Wherefore did thy mother give him notice? How looks she with favor on this imp? I know not, Doc. She says she pitied him because her father struck him with their car. Aye, there's the rub. He struck not George, but me. Tis a known scientific in circles as the Florence Nightingale effect indeed to fall in love with one for whom one helps. It happens also in our hospitals when nurses with their patients are enamored. Now, now to thy work, good lad, undo that, that, that undoing that which thou mistakenly hast done before. Uh, George, friend and comrade mine, how hast thou been? I, I nearly everywhere have searched for thee. Uh, dost thou remember the person who hath rescued thee from harm not long ago? Indeed. Good. Uh, there is someone thou shouldst meet. Lorraine, uh, hello. Oh, Calvin! Thou art here. Thou whom I feared I'd never see again. Yeah, pray, uh, let me introduce thee to my friend, uh, a lad of some renown, and handsome, too. <laughs> A lord to a lord, a man to a man, stuffed with all honorable virtues. Yea, a person excellent. Tis George McFly. The pleasure of meeting is mine own. How is thy precious, pitiable pate? Tis fine, tis well. Oh, so worried have I been since thou did wander hence the other night. Pray tell me, art thou well? For if thou art not, I shall be sadder than the day is long. Be not afraid, for I am well indeed. Alas, I am bound to fly to my next class. I must see thee again. See what I said? Is he not captain of a mighty ship? The pilot of a dream boat in the extreme? How shall I play these cards, Doc? For the girl hath hardly looked in his direction, see? The situation's worse than I had thought. The odds are stacked against our weaker hand. Apparently this queen would take the jack instead of the true king who suits her best. Thy mother is infatuated with her son, Ian Thee, as if we were the Greeks, and, and you were Oedipus to her Joe Costa. What? Wait one moment, Doc. What did thou say? Dost say my mother burneth hot for me? Precisely thus. Tis heavy by my troth. There is the, the word which thou dost use again. Tis heavy. All is heavy unto thee. Why hath the future so much heaviness? Hath aught disrupted something in the earth, affecting its own pull of gravity? No, what? Is it ever only science with thee? The only way those homo sapiens shall be convinced to mate with one another is to get them together by themselves. Thy mother and thy father, therefore, must have interaction in a social space. A date in layman's terms, such dost thou mean. Forsooth. Yet I have no idea for what the children of the 1950s do. They are thy parents, or shall be one day. Thou must know aught about their preferences. What are their common interests and likes? How do they pass their many hours together? Not that doth come to mind. Behold this sign. A rhythmic ceremonial ritual approacheth on our vital Saturday. The enchantment neath the sea dance, Doc, of course. The memory comes swiftly to my mind. It is their fate together to attend, wherein the lovers shall their first kiss share. <laughs> the plan is sealed. The wheels are set in motion. Stick to thy father as to a glue to wood, and no more shall we be led by happenstance. Make certain that he takes her to the dance. Exeunt. Act three, scene five, in the town of Hill Valley. Enter Marty and George. Aha! 
Good Marty, I must tell him all, for he hath been mine only friend of late. Ho, oh, Marty! George, why comest thou in haste? Thou were not there in school. Where hast thou been? How hast thou spent the first hours of the day? But too long, and I shall tell thee why. Yet first I shall confess, I need thy help. Lorraine, I must invite unto the dance, yet do not have the wisdom or the words to see it through. Be patient, I shall help. Uh, she is just yonder there in Lou's cafe. What was the cause of this most sudden change? For yesterday thou wert of rigid mind, as constant as the northern star in thee. The tale I'll tell, though thou mayst not believe. Last night hath come Darth Vader to my house from planet Vulcan. He hath ordered me to take Lorraine unto this weekend's dance, or he would swiftly melt my guiltless brain. Thy tale of melting brains will not divulge, for though I do believe, it may sound strange to others less supportive than myself. In sooth, I would not tell another soul. There, just inside. She waiteth for thee, George. Be bold, walk in, and make thine invitation. Yet I have not the words to make it so. Say anything that cometh to thy mind. That The world is full of guides, be thou a man. Whatever is most natural to thee, which springeth first unto thy fertile mind. Tis winter in my brain, for nothing comes. By Jove, it is a wonder I was born. What? No, nothing, nothing. Nay, uh, pray tell her this. Uh, save fate hath knit her t uh, thy twofold souls as one, and destiny hath brought thee both together. Speak softly to her tender ears that she hath beauty more than any other girl, that thou could search the world entire in vain, and ne'er wouldst find her match upon the earth. Such words fall gently on romantic ears. Art thou turned scribe, that thou should write this down? Oh, thou art well versed in love's confusing syntax. The Cyrano to my new Viet. The time hath come. Gird up thy loins and speak. Lou, give me milk and make it chocolate. Dutch courage will give me the strength I need. Dutch chocolate have ne'er led me astray. Lorraine? My density has brought me here. Excuse me? Pardon, this I meant to say. Do I not know thee somehow? Tell me truth. Indeed, dear lass. My name is George McFly. I, I am thy Density, <laughs> destiny. Oh. There ne'er was one so dense for thee as I, filled so completely with a love as mine, and destined thereupon for dense romance. Exeunt. Act four, scene four. In Hill Valley High School at the Enchantment Neath the Sea dance and outside the school. Enter Lorraine and Biff struggling. Enter George. Lo, rogue, remove thy filthy, damned hands. Release this woman from. Alas, tis Biff. Methinks thou hast the wrong car found, McFly. George, help me, please, if ever thou likest me. Turn thou around, and walk thou meekly away. Please, George. Art hard of hearing, eh, McFly? Close thou the door, and thou mayst still escape. I shall not let this bully have his way, but summon all the courage I can muster. Nay, Biff, it shall not be. Leave her alone. It shall be as you like it then, McFly. Here hast thou asked for punishment most grave, and thus I shall deliver unto thee. Cease this madness! Thou shalt break his arm! Leave him alone! Thine anger runs too hot! <laughs> this is too funny, by my troth. Oh, villain! Villain, smiling, damned villain! That one may smile and smile and be a villain. At least I'm sure it may be so in high school. And here I am, the Arthur to his Mordred, the nervous David to his vast Goliath, the weakened English to the haughty French. I'll knock the smile from his wicked face. My fist is like a pistol, 
Shrimps shall rise and make their mark, not be a stepping mat. Rise, temper that I never felt before, to get this hateful man what he deserveth. Yea, here I strike for every underdog. My father, man of strength and valor, too. Lorraine, say, art thou well? Will come with me? Ere now, I ne'er considered George McFly. Ere now, I never saw him in this light. Ere now, I never witnessed bravery. Ere now, I never heard love's tender call. Exit Marty. Act 4, Scene 6, in the town of Hill Valley, near the clock tower, the storm brews. Enter Marty and Doc. Great Scott, the cord we need hath come unplugged. No more future speech, take thou the cable. And I shall throw thee the rope. Indeed. Up the street. How many gears work their steady tasks? <laughs> I am afeard, and yet there is no time for doubt. I deftly walk, lightning bursts. Oh, I got all space. <laughs> Alas, this poor science, frightening as this. Can't hear me, Doc. I prithee, throw the rope. Ah, done. Be swift, good young Marty. Done. Now pull it, hands. Ah, uh, yes. Even if it must be shouted, hear these words. I must tell thee about what? the future. What? About the future. I must tell thee, Doc. I, I can't not uh, hear thee. You're the, the, the too far away. Thou shalt upon the night when I return. Oh, oh, no. oh, 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 bells. What tale of fright the turbulency tells? Doc is affrighted so. I fear he'll fall. Uh, the clock strikes 10 o'clock. Thou must depart. No more yelling words I cannot hear. But four mere minutes stand betwixt thee and the possibility of thy success. Oh, behold the time and fly, fly ere it is too late. Oh, oh, there's Doc. And doth he still the cords repair? Fail not, brave scientist and treasured friend. My 88 miles per hour achieved, tis set. If it be no, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, it will still come. The readiness is all. Oh, oh it is 1004, the lightning strikes. I join the cord. Ah! Crash of drums, a flash of lights. My time machine flies out of sight. It worked. Oh, it worked. Oh, oh that remaineth our two fiery streaks, and of our triumph, all creation speaks. Exit. Act five, scene two. At the McFly house. Enter Marty, Jennifer, and Doc, strangely clad, arriving from the future in the DeLorean. <coughs> Quick! 
Marty! Ah! Uh, uh, Marty, thou must voyage hence with me! Where shall we go? Oh, once more, back to the future! What, what art thou doing, Doc? What is uh, thy plan? Uh, uh, just some useless refuse uh, <clears throat> that I, 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 I must uh, use anon. <laughs> <clears throat> it's uh, thereby I shall fill Mr. Fusion uh, that I may have the necessary fuel. Home energy reactors useful are. I prithee quickly climb inside the car. Nay, Doc, I, I have but lately here arrived. My Jennifer is here, and we are bound to take my newfound truck and yonder drive. Well, bring her with all, for this concerns her too. Of what art thou most vaguely speaking, Doc? What shall befall us in the coming years? We are changed aught is to an ass. <laughs> Uh, nay, Mari, ye do flourish by my troth. Uh, it is your children who are my concern. We must do something about your children. See? Though we may understand it not, we'll go. Doc, <coughs> we've no room upon this shortened street. Go farther back, I pray, and thou would have Noah Road to realize 88. Ah, uh, be ready for audacious episodes. Whither we go, we have no use for roads. <laughs> Exeunt Omnes. Hidden lane in deepest wood Was born a child who played as no one could His genius was pronounced in from boyhood His name was Jonathan Bernard Oh good, how good When good begins to play the lute Sing ho, sing hi, sing hey Sing ho, sing hi, sing hey Sing ho, sing hi, sing hey Sing ho Sing hi, sing hey, sing ho. Sing hi, sing hey, sing ho. Sing hi, sing hey. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. Give yourselves a massive round of applause. Well done, everyone. Well done. That was absolutely incredible. What a joy to watch. Thank you all so much for that. Oh, I'm feeling amazing right now. I hope you guys at home are feeling just as good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please do get in your questions for the q and uh, I'm sure that there'll definitely be questions for Ian, questions for Jeffrey, questions for the rest of our cast and crew. So start thinking of them and sending them through now. First of all, however, I'd like to say thank you uh, to everyone involved in tonight's production, starting as always with our amazing producer and indeed this week's guest director, Sarah Peachy. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I'm an actor and innovation project manager based in Glasgow. Our associate stage manager and master of props, Emily Ingram. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a writer, director and stage manager in Edinburgh. Our resident movement and fight director, Enrique Ortuño. Hi, my name is Enrique. I'm a fight and movement director based in London, UK. And our sound designer, Adam Woodhams. Hi, I'm a sound designer based in the southwest of England. Wonderful. So, casting director Sydney Aldridge has put together an incredible cast for tonight's presentation, as always. Starting with Marty McFly, Alex Britt. Hello, hi. I am Alex Britt, and I am an actor that's usually based in London. Doc Brown, Jeffrey Weissman. Thank you. I'm, uh, uh, like you said, Jeffrey Weissman, uh, up in Northern California in the wine country, an actor all my life, and an educator. Uh, George McFly, Sebi H. Cridland. Hi, I'm Sebi H. Cridland. I'm an actor musician based in London. Lorraine Baines McFly, Mariam Grace. Hi, I'm Mariam Grace and I'm a professional actor based in London. As Biff Tannen, Gregory John Phelps. Hi everyone, my name is Gregory John Phelps. I'm an actor musician based in Brooklyn, New York. And our one person ensemble for this evening, Stephanie Crignola. Hi, I'm Stephanie Crignola. I'm an actor, director, educator, and I live in Austin, Texas. With our valiant swing with several cameos tonight, Robbie Capaldi. Hello, hi, I'm Robbie Capaldi. I, I'm an actor based in London. And uh, last but not last, the excuse me, last but not least, let's give it up for the bard himself, Ian Desher. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Ian, and I live in Portland, Oregon, in the States. Wonderful stuff. Uh, and for those who uh, maybe missed the introduction, it's worth pointing out that Jeffrey Weissman actually played George McFly in uh, Back to the Future Parts 2 and 3 uh, in the original movies. Uh, so it's been an incredible honour to have Jeffrey on board. He's absolutely thrown himself at every uh, dramatic opportunity that we've pitched his way, come up with so many more amazing ideas himself, and has filled our world with some incredible props as well from the films themselves. So that's been an absolute delight for us in rehearsal. I hope you enjoyed it at home. Uh, so yes, wonderful work everyone, wonderful work. Hopefully the questions should start coming in soon. Uh, I think, Jeffrey, while we wait for the questions to come through, would you be able to uh, do us a bit of show and tell on some of your incredible uh, props? Tell. Sure. <clears throat> Casual one there in the background. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, I was directing uh, uh, a couple shows and training all the lookalikes and, and uh, bodysuit characters for Universal Japan in Osaka in uh, 2000, 2001. And this I had uh, fabricated for our Doc Brown. Unfortunately, they never shipped it out. They never paid for shipping and uh, I got stuck with it. So uh, luckily I have this for uh, this project in particular. Amazing. And uh, uh, there are, I see the hoverboard behind you as well. Yes. Well, there, there are uber fans out there uh, that have been making uh, props from the films for, for many years. This, uh, this is not a Mattel hoverboard. I think, I'm not sure, uh, the Madrid is the name of the company. I, um, but this was an actual skateboard that they took the wheels off of. Uh, Mattel Amazing. did come out with a, a hoverboard toy that you could get. And then uh, cosplayers that I know actually made these uh, it's, it's really wonderful uh, since my participation in the films being discovered by the fans over the years because I was pretty much kept secret when the films came out. Uh, they didn't want the fans really to know that Crispin wasn't in the films that appeared. Uh, so I didn't really get to, uh, recognition until really many years later and doing the fan cons around the world, meeting uh, so many great, wonderful hearts. Uh, it's, it's really been rewarding. I've had uh, uh, especially the cosplayers. I had one in particular make for me. Uh, my first action figure, uh, George McFly hanging upside down part two, 2015 action figure, uh, Brad Fife in, in Hollywood. He uh, is uh, also put together Griff's gang with some other fantastic cosplayers and they do events. Uh, well, that's enough about me. Do we have questions? <laughs> we do have questions, absolutely. But that was wonderful. Uh, I, di I didn't want to interrupt because I was just enraptured. It's all wonderful. And that, that little action figure, that's got, that's got to mean a lot as well. That's amazing. Uh, got one, one question here from Matthew. What has the Pop Shakespeare experience been like for Ian? Oh, uh, what's it been like? It's been a dream come true. I mean, uh, this is so much fun to, to get to uh, dive into movies that I love and reinterpret them and add a little bit of myself to them as well. Um, so it, that has been so much fun. Then getting to do these productions over the last four weeks uh, has been so much fun. So it, it's just, you know, I, I feel like I'm the luckiest guy ever, honestly. Fantastic. Uh, got a question here from Michael. Are there any plans to adapt the rest of the Back to the Future trilogy? Not at this point. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we'll see. The, the answer is always we'll see because we live Absolutely. in, you know. Yeah. I've got to say as well, I, I feel like it might be a more economical job than with other trilogies because there's so many callbacks through the other two films that you'd be able to <laughs> self-reference your own stuff. Yeah, that's be right. wonderful. Uh, wonderful. So, uh, so we've got a question here from Adam. Did Jeffrey have any particular advice for Seb? Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of, we're, I, I didn't get any questions from, from Seth and, and I loved watching his work. He just nailed everything. Uh, it, it was, it was really exciting and, and, uh, lovely. I'm sure Crispin, um, loved it. Well, thank, <laughs> thank you. Excited. Thank you, Jeffrey. That means a lot coming from you. Um, I think you helped me a bit with the kind of thinking of uh, falling forward a lot um, in the first rehearsal. So I kind of tried to incorporate a bit of that. But um, that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you said that. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so for those at home, I, I mentioned that I had worked with Crispin on a film at the American Film Institute a year before he made the first film. 
And I was fascinated with his acting. I thought he was a fascinating actor and he wore great beetle boots. And uh, his, his weight was always kind of going forward. And then of course, studying his work from the first film, you can see that in, in his walking and his uh, kind of gravity and, uh, and, and the hand expressions and, and also the placement of the voice, which I had to do, you know, the, hey, you get your damn hand. Oh, oh, oh. You know, I had to, uh, I couldn't reinvent it. I had to imitate it. So uh, fans would, couldn't tell that he wasn't there. Uh, so it was uh, really a testament to your work, Seth, on, on uh, really pulling it together and owning it. So we've got a question here, uh, which might, might take a while, but we'll dig in. How the heck, thank you for using uh, a PG friendly language, did you get all the props and special effects to work? Uh, I think it's probably good for Emily to start us off with that one. I am actually not quite sure where to start with that one. Uh, we had a, a huge research and development uh, Zoom meeting uh, between all of us, between me, uh, Rob, Adam, Enrique and Sarah on Friday and um, we went through the script just in order um, discussing what props came where, what we wanted them to be like and the kind of feel of it and uh, the word that get, uh, kept getting bounced around quite a lot was uh, steampunk, um, that sort of slightly uh, anachronistic um, sort of metal and wood and, and natural uh, sort of natural materials blend into one style. Um, that, that was uh, the, the tone of the piece that we uh, really went for. And um, Sarah, Rob, do you want to sort of speak to um, that as, a, as an aesthetic choice at all? Sarah, over to you. Uh, so yeah, we um, I, I briefly spoke to Ian about um, the, the approach of the kind of mashup. And I think um, Ian said that they kept obviously a lot of the kind of 80s and 50s references um, within the, the sort of Shakespearean translation. Um, so we kind of wanted to keep a bit of that um, Elizabethan-y sort of feel. So we kind of kept it quite broad and, and as Emily said, incorporated all of that sort of mechanical side of things. Um, but uh, but yeah, we obviously wanted to be faithful to the originals because I think uh, in our first meeting, I think everyone spoke to being a huge fan of the films. Um, so we wanted to kind of pay, you know, do an homage to that, um, but incorporating all of those lovely um, Shakespearean uh, elements that um, in so brilliantly woven into the story. Absolutely. And I think one thing that uh, is under kind of under recognized, I guess, is the level of choreography of the film itself. We went back and watched the film as part of the research and development process. And you can see that every single moment is tight as a nut and is actually quite theatrical in its quality. And so actually bringing a lot of those moments to life uh, was thanks to Enrique and his incredible ability to kind of bring out that specificity, uh, which was absolutely fantastic. So thank you, mate, for that. So I know you wouldn't have brought it up yourself. So I'm going to I'm going to throw throw shine on you from over here um, and then probably the last point to make on that is that I think this may actually somehow have ended up with more cues uh, for tech and special effects than Star Wars I don't know how we managed it but uh, something that our audience may not know we put all of those things together obviously they were coming in in dribs and drabs in different places Adam's working separately Enrique's working separately Emily's working separately Sarah's working separately I'm working separately we put it all together this morning and so that was the first time that we saw all of these things happen in a row. And I, I, I'm not going to lie, my brain slightly melted in the first run. <laughs> I was like, my word, there's so much in this. But I'm so glad that it was all there. And I'm so glad that it all came off. Emily. Speaking of melting, is it worth me talking about the fire element of the props at all? Absolutely, go for it. So we realised that, you know, it's back to the future. You have to have the, the um, flames leading from the wheels because otherwise it's not back to the future. That, that was um, something that we all agreed on Friday. What I hadn't counted on is how light it stays in the evenings in Scotland where um, me, Rob and Sarah are based. Uh, it stays light until really, really late on at night um, here at the moment, which is lovely. But it means that if you need to be filming at night in order to uh, have the flame showing, you kind of need to wait a while. So on, I think, was it was it last night? Um, I sent uh, Sarah a message saying, I'm just waiting for nightfall so I can film the fire. And I was waiting for nightfall and waiting for nightfall. And, wait. and uh, it ended up being about, I think, 11, between 11 o'clock and midnight that I crept out into my yard. I was kind of whispering so I didn't wake up my neighbors. So I didn't look out and go, what's she doing burning things in her, in her back garden? And um, it was, uh, uh, 
string soaked in paraffin in order to get that really straight line of flames uh, because we just couldn't find um, any other way to do it. But modern string is made so that you can't burn it easily because of health and safety laws. So I was just soaking it in more paraffin, soaking it in more kitchen oil, and just sitting out there in my in my back garden um, for, for a while trying to get this thing to light. So uh, I think what I'm really trying to say is I'm probably on some kind of watch list now, but it was totally worth it um, for all of this. Absolutely. And if they need the evidence, we can point them in the direction of this video. This is why. <laughs> if the uh, flames are showing up on your satellite imagery. Uh, wonderful. So I've got a question here for Ian. How do you go about writing these? Do you start with your favourite iconic lines or moments from the film and then kind of flesh out around that? Or do you tackle it chronologically? What is the process? I tackle it, yeah, uh, in the order of the movie, almost always. So um, I, I will sit down with the movie and try to you know, usually in the, in the evening of writing, I'll try to get through three, four or five minutes of the movie at a time uh, using the script, if it's online or the captions, you know, uh, that are, that can, you can turn on and uh, things like that. Uh, there are some times where I will take a break away and just write a speech uh, by itself. Like there's a, in the big chase scene with uh, Biff chasing Marty when he's on the ski, uh, skateboard in 1955, uh, that's one of Marty's 88 line speeches where he's uh, he is uh, sort of narrating what's going on as it happens. And um, I wrote that at a pub with some friends uh, when we were uh, all together, sort of uh, uh, sitting around writing together. And I, I wrote out that speech and hadn't gotten to it in the in the course of the normal writing yet. But so sometimes I'll do that. But uh, most of the time it's, you know, one chunk at a time. Awesome. Uh, so we've got had quite a lot of questions about um, how much rehearsal did you have? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and also, have any of you uh, acted with each other before? Uh, so I'll throw that over to our actors. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll jump in on that one. Um, at rehearsal time, how much rehearsal time do we have? Um, uh, hours? 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 A few hours. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Literally hours, though. We were fine. Yeah, hours, yeah, hours. <laughs> but like, just maybe like 12, 12, 14, 12, 16, maybe four. If I we're think being 12, lucky. mate. I think 12, 12 okay. 12, I think, yeah. I'm not counting, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I haven't worked with anyone here before, um, I don't think. Sorry. <laughs> Burn if so. Uh, quick shout out as well. Sorry, we have a. So, oh, sorry, Jeffrey, go on. I was just saying 12 hours with 35 years previous study. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. Certainly helps. We, Certainly we still helps. gave you plenty to do, though. <laughs> I think that was the case for Sarah, our director, as well, because uh, she, she had uh, all those years of study to the point where we were watching the film for research and she was saying, in this bit that's coming up, <laughs> this happens. And she was kind of quoting it a line ahead. It was absolutely brilliant. So we, we had absolutely the right people for the job on this. It was amazing. Uh, and just to let you guys know, uh, we've got a comment here from the audience saying, thank you so much for doing this. I thought it was going to be a table read. You went way beyond my expectations. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Uh, we aim to surprise and delight. So I hope that's been the case. Um, and just going through the rest of the questions here, quick shout out as well to uh, Dominic Brewer uh, returning as our uh, universal opening theme as well. Uh, one, of, one of our uh, most returning actors, Dominic, uh, put it, putting together an amazing universal theme just to give us a, that full circle effect from 16th Century Fox all the way back when we did Star Wars those many, many moons ago. A <laughs> uh, couple more questions coming in here. What was that? Sorry, Gregory? You said that, that those aren't moons. <laughs> very good, very good. Um, da, 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 here we go. Uh, who sang the intro bit? Yes, that was Dominic. Uh, how many rehearsals did you have? Like four? <laughs> four for about a couple of hours each. Uh, someone said, Emily, did you say Friday? <laughs> when we did the R&D. Oh, I think Emily's frozen. I, oh, have I frozen? I did say Friday. I did say Friday, yes. Friday was what I said. <laughs> um, if there was more time, what other scenes, dialogue, props or effects would you have included in this production? I think I'd like to get your answer on this, Ian. What, what do you wish we could have seen? Oh, good question. Um, uh, I will say that uh, Nicole from Quirkbooks, who is on the, 
on the line, though not uh, showing her face right now. Um, she uh, is the one who sort of picked the bits out of the script and then uh, Sarah and Rob uh, added some more bits. And I, I think we got almost all of the sort of really iconic uh, moments and scenes and that sort of thing. So uh, off the top of my head, I don't know what I would have, uh, what I would have put back in other than per possibly uh, Marty first going back in time uh, at the end of act one. Um, but I mean, it was, I love, I mean, I love the thought that's gone into this, which I had nothing to do with, uh, where you sort of get the whole narrative uh, thread, you know, so that you can see the whole story. Um, so, uh, yeah, I have no complaints. Wonderful. Uh, a quick bit of trivia here as well. Apparently, part three turns 30 today. Back to the Future part three, 30 today. So happy, happy birthday to Back to the Future part three. Uh, and on that note, ladies and gentlemen, that is all our time for this evening. Uh, so I'd like to say thank you once again to our incredible cast. I'd like to say thank you, uh, of course, to Mr. Ian Desher, who's put all of these incredible scripts together. It has been one of the great honours and privileges of uh, my life, and I know a lot of the rest of the crew's life as well, to be able to uh, perform these uh, plays. I've had them on my shelf for many years, uh, and it's always been a dream of mine to get to do them. So uh, this has just been an absolute absolute joy and privilege. So uh, please do consider joining us over at youtube.com forward slash Rob Miles for Romeo and Juliet at 7 p.m. BST, 2 p.m. EDT. Uh, I think you're going to love it. It's shaping up really nicely in rehearsals. Uh, and other than that, ladies and gentlemen, that is all she wrote for now. So I hope you've enjoyed these presentations from The Show Must Go Online and Quirk Books. Please do uh, support Quirk Books and The Show Must Go Online by going to quirkbooks.biz and buying any of Ian's books uh, in order to donate a portion of the profits to show must go online so thank you to quirk books for their incredible generosity thank you nicole for organizing all of this thank you ian thank you adam thank you Enrique. thank you emily thank you sarah thank you all of the members of our cast special thank you to jeffrey for being so willing and game to be up for this it's been a real honor to work with you mate and thank you so much so that is all from us ladies and gentlemen thank you and good night